Hi guys, this is Jasmine with Keto in the Kitchen with Jasmine, but we're not actually doing keto today. What we're doing is we're talking about my documentary and how I wound up with a court case in Vancouver, the Supreme Court in British Columbia. I wanted to tell you guys a little bit of background on that. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, my Supreme Court case was up in Vancouver Island in British Columbia in Canada, and it ended May 5th, 2023. Um, the judge signed the order sympathetically stating that to my attorney that she hoped that this would be the end of a long saga or saga for me and that it would bring me some resolution. Um, it did bring me resolution, but it never brought me the justice that I felt that I was due. Um, although her intentions were well received, after everything finalized, I couldn't hold down a job. Uh, my PTSD got really, really bad, and this is going to explain a little bit about that. Um, I was diagnosed with PTSD in two, December of 2016. Um, I felt that my symptoms from all of the trauma that I had been through were getting significantly worse, even though the ordeal with... Uh, you know, the USCIS and British Columbia were over. Um, it hadn't ended for me personally. I was having uh, night terrors and uh, night sweats. I had no appetite. Um, I was having, I wasn't, I'm not diagnosed bipolar, but I was having mood swings. I was angry at the world, angry at God, wondering why he caused me to go through so much suffering um, at the hands of my parents, but more specifically my mom for the things that she had put me through. Not only that, but my memory was bad. I couldn't remember anything. And it, I, it wasn't making sense to myself as to why I was doing the things that I was doing. Um, I could very nearly, it was nearly impossible for me to complete tasks at work. Uh, I had shame and hatred for myself. I couldn't even look myself in the mirror without hating what I was looking at, which was my own image. And I never felt clean. I felt like it was dirty and despicable, um, despite being clean. And that's why, and why was I being punished? Why was I being put through this? What did I do to have parents that put me through this? Um, I have flashbacks and I wanted to escape the reality that I was in because it was so horrible. It was so traumatizing. I couldn't get past what I had to go through since the immigration nightmare had started for me back in 2019. So basically for four years total, I had to battle immigration and being nice to a mother that I felt hated me because of what she put me through. I felt like she hated me. I felt like an orphan. I felt like she abandoned me and that she sold me out to my enemies and that she stabbed me in the back that both of my parents did. Um, I basically had no supports going through my immigration process here in the United States. Um, and if it weren't for my husband, I would have gone through this alone because basically I was the one that did all the research, the legwork and the footwork all by myself while trying to help my special needs young adult son recover from head trauma. Um, so let me tell you how this all began. I lived in Colorado. My driver's license expired. I want, I went to obtain a new driver's license from Colorado, but because Colorado is a real ID state, uh, the DMV department of motor vehicles wouldn't give me a driver's license because my passport, which was my United States passport, which proved I was a United States citizen born in Canada, um, had expired. They suggested I contact the State Department, and so I did. And the State Department opened a file on me and asked me to send my U.S. passport to them, and I complied. Uh, there was a lien on my passport for a past due debt. Um, when the U.S. De State Department sent me back my uh, U.S. passport, um, it was hole punched. And thinking nothing of it, I went back to the DMV in Colorado to obtain for my, my driver's license to sign up for it again. And the agent behind the counter said, had your expired US passport not been hole punched, we could have issued you a new driver's license. And thinking to myself, I thought, why didn't they tell me this sooner? Why didn't they tell me this prior? Why am I learning about this right now? 
Uh, I never would have sent my U U.S. passport into the State Department had I known that. But no one bothered to tell me that. Had someone actually said that to me, what the rules were, what I needed to follow, my gosh, I would have had, you know, I would have followed the rules. But no, no one said anything. So, you know, basically I sent it into my U.S. passport into the State Department. And I did get it back hole punched. And um, I tried to apply for my driver's license. And they gave it to other people who are not U.S. citizens, but they wouldn't give it to me. They said if I had had a Canadian driver's license or a Canadian passport that they would give her, give me a driver's license, but I never had a driver's license. So you might ask, why couldn't I just renew my U.S. passport so that I could use that to obtain a driver's license? Well, my U.S. passport had a lien on it due to a debt that I owed, and they would not release my U.S. passport until that debt was paid. And I couldn't afford to pay it because I needed to go back to work. And I needed to have a driver's license to go back to work because Colorado was a real ID state. So it was basically a vicious circle that I was in. So with this new understanding, I had to figure out a way around the passport issue. And I started researching pro bono immigration attorneys, which of course was legal aid because I basically didn't have any money to work with. Um, so I did fortunately find a legal aid attorney uh, through Colorado, through Grand Junction, I signed a retainer with her, with her paralegal and secured the attorney. She contacted the State Department, was told I was going to have to go through an N-600 application process to prove that I was a U.S. citizen born abroad to a parent who was a U.S. citizen. So my attorney asked me to send in my Canadian birth certificate, and it was at that moment that I really looked at my birth certificate because it was so oblivious to me. I hadn't even paid attention to it because it was just not a non-issue to me, my birth certificate. All I ever really used was my driver's license. But I looked at it at that birth certificate. And I mean, I've looked at my birth certificate since 2002, you know, when my parents helped me file for my U.S. passport. But, but, I guess I just figured that once the issue with my passport was completed and I used my passport and driver's license for everything, that that would be correct and that would be the end of it. And I never even thought that there would be a lien on my U.S. passport ever. But there was, and um, it basically left me an undocumented American stuck between Canada and the United States. So two different countries without any documentation, documentation at all whatsoever. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go anywhere. I was, you know, begging for work, even under the table, somebody to pay me for something. Um, it was a basic nightmare. And I looked down at my birth certificate and I read my mother's birth, birth name. And it said, um, Janice Elaine. And it said the last name, which I thought to myself, that's not even my mom's name. That's not her name. And then it said her place of birth, New Market, Ontario. Um, I grew up with my mother. I know exactly what her full name is. I know what her birth date is and I know where she was born. And this was a lie that was on my birth certificate. And I knew it and I looked at it and I said, this is shame. This is shame right here. This is lies. Um, it dawned on me that my mother had taken me on a trip across country through Canada right after graduation. I was about 18 years old. She wanted to show me basically my place of birth when I was 18 as a graduation present. And, you know, and I remember one statement that she made to me when we were driving in the camper van, the Volkswagen camper van. And she said, um, I hope I don't get pulled over. I better call my attorney and see if I'm still wanted in Canada. And she just says this randomly out of the blue. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What is wrong with you? What do you mean? Does that mean I'm going to have to drive your camper van back? And that's what I asked her. You know, I asked her if I was going to have to drive the camper van back by myself in a country I wasn't familiar with at 18. Um, but she said, well, I'm, I'm scared that I might go to jail. And she went and made a phone call and came back and she goes, shoo, I think it's okay. I think everything's good. I'm not, you know, wanted for anything. I'm like, uh-huh. Well, that's good to know. Great. <laughs>
Good for you. Congratulations. You want a lollipop? That's awesome. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because that's something that everyone can say of their parents, right? Yeah. All right. So at that moment, you know, that memory recall all came back to me because like I said, I was dealing with PTSD from all the trauma that I was put through basically at the hands of my parents and other people. Um, and it was a trigger. So it triggered a memory and I was like, wow, it all dawned on me. You know, you would think that you rem would remember a significant detail like that, but when you're battling trauma, you don't remember things like that. Um, one of the symptoms that you have is poor memory and poor memory recall. And then another memory after that came flooding back in. I remember that we were living in government housing, the projects in Detroit, and my mother continuously moved me from school system to school system in elementary school. And I remember one telephone call that she had with the school administration that she would get my birth certificate corrected at, by the end of the year. But by the end of that year, she never did. And she moved me to another school system. And so she had to re-register me with it, that same Canadian birth certificate because she failed to naturalize me when she came back. So basically I was moved from school system to school system. I really never developed, you know, a good social network because I wasn't in a stable situation, wasn't in a stable environment to be able to do so. Um, and I guess that looking back, it was because she was afraid to go to jail because of the crimes that she had committed. She was never naturalized me and uh, basically um, she figured that she was afraid of being extradited back to Canada for fraud of living under an assumed name as a Canadian citizen claiming to be born in Canada in Newmarket, Ontario, in order to obtain health benefits because she was pregnant with me while traveling in Canada. But there were other stories that I was told of that situation is that she and my dad were fleeing charges and they went under assumed names in Canada and then they got in trouble in Canada and then came back. How true that is, I have no idea. I was a baby when this all happened to me. Um, so I'm just explaining what led up to that to this point. Um, at any rate, when my attorney received my birth certificate, her paralegal sent me an email asking me, to answer several questions. She said, you told us your mom's name was Celeste Ann Hamilton. You filled this out on the N-600 application, but your birth certificate states otherwise that her name is Janice, blah, 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 born in Newmarket, Ontario. I said, yes, I told them. And I, they asked me to explain the discrepancy because who wouldn't, you know, that seems kind of weird. Well, the problem is without any real proof of my mother's documentation that she had given to the U.S. Passport Agency to rectify the situation that explained her aliases, my attorney was unable to process my N-600 application through USCIS, the government agency that basically oversees lawful immigration to the United States. They asked if they could speak with my mother in order to obtain this information, meaning my attorney and paralegal. And I said, yes, of course, because I wanted to get this corrected. Why wouldn't I say yes? Um, they followed up with her. They had several, you know, they said they talked to her. So I'm, I don't know how many conversations they had with her, but they did talk to her. And they asked her if they could see her documents and all of her paperwork on them and on the contingency that I would never see her documents nor have access and or copies to her paperwork. That was my mother's contingency to my lawyer and my paralegal. They agreed with my mother. So by this time I received my N-600 application, her documents were redacted. What that means is that I only received black blank pages of the paperwork where the paperwork should be and none of the paperwork was I able to see. I saw my paperwork, my information, and the application process, but hers were blacked out, all copies. And this is what they had sent my attorney and paralegal to USCIS. I still have the paperwork. Um, so what that means is during that this process, they asked me to create an online account with USCIS, which I complied, I did, and so that I could track my process. And they asked me, um, Basically, they stated that once the N-600 application was filed, that they were done helping me any further. 
that was it. They were wiping their hands and that was it. Um, so I agreed with them and I opened an online account with USCIS. And upon doing so, I received an appointment in the mail online that I would go in for live fingerprinting with the FBI, with USCIS. And their office ran through the federal database and my picture was taken. But what I couldn't understand was that there were two N-600 applications in the database under my name, listed under my name instead of only one. And it was confusing to me. So um, I should back up maybe a little bit and explain that while my N-600 was being prepared, that it was suggested by the agent at the State Department after he had heard my story, because we talked on the phone, to take a legal DNA test to prove that my mother and I were related and that she was my biological mother. So I talked to my mother about it and she agreed to take it. She knew I didn't have the money uh, to be able to pay for this. And she stated that she would take it from my inheritance that was left over, which was $1,000, and that she would give it to me so that I could cover both her test and mine. So not only did I have to cover my test for something I didn't put myself through, I had to cover my mother's also from my inheritance. Okay. So we did take the test. We had to go down to legal center, that test for DNA testing, biological testing. It is for legal court purposes. They, so they conduct the DNA testing for through the court system. So it's a legal process. Uh, we had to do fingerprinting. Make, they had to take pictures. We had to sign our signatures. Um, and that's when the test came back, it proved that we were 99.99% .99 related and that she was my biological mother. Then I went in, into the USCIS local office and I had my interview and I gave the interview my documentation. I had to prove my identity. I gave her my driver's license, my social security, my expired passport, and any other identification that I had. She made copies of all of it and then I had the live fingerprinting done and I had my picture taken. During that time, I spoke with my attorney's paralegal and I told her that my mother and I had a DNA test done to help the process along. But instead of being grateful and supportive, you know, for my help, she exploded on the phone, which I have recorded on video, and asked me, why did you do that? I explained my stance on it I, I, and she was screaming at me and I explained to her that it was because I needed to make sure that my documentation was going to process properly. I had been through so much, I wasn't taking any chances. Um, and so basically I needed to tell her, I wanted to make sure that my, my application processes without any problems whatsoever. After that was when my attorney told me that the N-600 application was submitted to USCIS. It was filed and then I could deal directly with them and to create an account. So after receiving notice in the USCIS database that I had an upcoming interview, my N-600 application from my attorney's office was uploaded to by the USCIS agency. I clicked on the link to view it just to see what it looked like and to read the cover letter and things like that. I was just curious. And when I and I wanted to see if there were any changes between what I had received through FedEx from my attorneys for my paralegal and what had been uploaded. And when I looked at it and do, um, due to the Freedom of Information Act, all of my mother's paperwork was there and visible. And I could hardly believe it. I, was, I felt so grateful and for, so fortunate and so blessed that I not only downloaded the entire N-600 application but as and saved it as a PDF, but in addition to that, I saved each individual piece of documentation from my mother's as a PDF because my attorney up in Canada was starting to question the legitimacy of what I was telling her about my parents because there was no documentation whatsoever. So I then took all of the individual documentations, the PDFs I saved from my mother's documents that showed all of her aliases and also my father's, and I sent them, I uploaded them and attached them to an email that I sent to my attorney in Canada. And my attorney's response in email was, wow. I'm like, yeah, really? Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really great, huh? So after that, um, it did show, um, like I said, it showed all of the aliases and, uh, 
my attorney up in Canada said that we could now get started on filing for an amendment for my Canadian birth certificate certificate to show that at least one of my parents was a United States parent, was a United States citizen. And to basically amend my birth certificate, my Canadian birth certificate with my mother's real name and real place of birth in the United States. So that way I could show that I'm a United States citizen I have a Canadian birth certificate to prove it and also my N600 um, paperwork, my certificate to prove I'm also a United States citizen. So we had basically started the process of that. So in February of 2022, um, I basically moved to Georgia with my husband and I explained everything I had gone through to my mother-in-law and her brother, a retired commander of the United States Navy. And then soon after, I went to my USCIS ceremony in Atlanta, Georgia, and became an official U.S. citizen. Woo yay! Finally, I didn't have to rely on my U.S. passport, which was so good for me. Um, it would be some time after that, however, like a while, maybe a year, year and a half, um, that I basically had to wait for the hearing with the British, with the Supreme Court in British Columbia. British Columbia and Vancouver in order to amend my Canadian birth certificate. Uh, my attorney told me that she entered, um, can if I had entered Canada with fraudulent information, basically, so if I had signed up for a Canadian passport and tried to obtain a driver's license that way when I was back in Colorado, what would have happened is I would have been committing an, un, you know, basically a felony. Um, because of the fact that my birth certificate contained fake information, fraudulent information on it. Um, so during that process, all of it basically took about four years to finalize. It was traumatizing. Every day was a nail biter. It was stressful. It was hard going to sleep. Um, it was, I'd wake up in the middle of the night. The only thing that kept me sane basically was having my special needs son there to take care of. I loved having him there. Um, but basically, you know, having to ask for the mercy of others to try to make it through financially, being unable to work and doing my best to provide for my son while being chronically sick with diabetes, uh, all of this, all of this was extremely traumatizing on me and it further exasperated my PTSD symptoms that I had already gone through with my mom and my dad growing up. So it was worse. And I was seeing a trauma therapist for all this, trying to sort things out in my life. You know, I mean, after I don't understand why any parents would want to put their children through something like that. I never would dream of putting my kids through something like that. But anyway, after receiving my N600 certificate, my attorney and I worked together gathering information and putting together an affidavit and petition that would go to the Supreme Court in Canada. It was a long wait with much, much research on her part and also my part. And because I don't think she had ever encountered a case like this before and wanted to make sure that she was presenting it to the Supreme Court in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada the right way as opposed to just hurriedly putting it, something together and having it get rejected. Um, she made sure that she followed every step that she could. And she appeared on behalf of my mother's as my mother's agent. She couldn't appear as my mother's attorney because she was already my attorney. So that wouldn't work. Um, my mother didn't object to the change or the amendment declaring that she was indeed this person, Janice, who was born and declared that she was born in Newmarket, Ontario, declared that she had lied in order to, you know, basically in order to get health benefits is what happened. And that her real name was Celeste and she was born in the United States. Um, the Supreme Court accepted the change and accepted the fact that we were seeking a court order and they uh, granted the court order to us and sent it to Vital Statistics to have my birth certificate amended with my mother's real birth name and place of birth. And once completed by the Supreme Court, it was in mail to Vital Statistics. Vital Statistics mailed it out, my corrected birth certificate showing that my mother's real name was the last born in the United States, and I am no longer an undocumented American without a driver's license, I'm no longer stuck between two countries, and praise God, I'm very grateful for that. So thank you, God, and I did a lot of footwork, 
I did a lot of research, a lot of follow-up in this. I, I had to be, basically be on top of my attorney here in the United States, and I made constant contact with my attorney in British Columbia. So this is my story as to why, I, as a United States citizen, I went through an immigration process and also an amendment to my Canadian birth certificate. Thanks, guys, for being here.